Hello, and welcome back to Less Is More Education with your host, Steve Flores. And this is a place where we take a look at everything that matters to teachers. All right. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to review uh, the literature on working memory. Actually, not all the literature, but a historical paper in 1992 written by uh, Alan Baddeley on working memory. Now, working memory is one of these awesome things that that we use every day, and we're going to see how we can utilize the ideas of how our working memory works to uh, applying it to teaching. Okay, so we're going to start off by playing a game, and here's the way the game is going to work. I'm going to read to you a bunch of sentences, and once I'm done, I'm going to say go, and you're going to try to repeat back to me the last word of each sentence. You ready? Here we go. This is going to be level one. The sailor sold the parrot. The vicar opened the book. Go. Okay, so if you said parrot and book, awesome. You did a great job. Let's do level two. According to a recent poll, Betty White is the most famous actress in cinema. It was so cold in the summer that many people had to change their plans. Yesterday, everyone went to the town hall to listen to the mayor's speech. His grandfather gave him a beautiful pen for passing the course. Her pretty expressive eyes turned to me with a deep look. When we realized he had a fever, we ran to call the doctor and go. Okay, so if you said cinema, plans, speech, course, look, and doctor, congratulations, you passed level two. Let's see if you can make it through level three. Okay, although we spent the whole afternoon analyzing the problem, we did not find the solution. If we are not careful, we will exhaust all the resources of the earth. Now that a man has died, the police would have to act. Tired of being bullied, the student went to complain to the principal. After the concert, musicians came out to the singing and clapping of the audience. In order to carry out the medical test, the doctor checked, in, checked the patient into the hospital. The chief or of police informed the mayor that crime was on the rise. The historical monuments are comprehensive and well presented in the new guide. His wife scolded him frequently for coming home late. Go. Okay, so if you answered solution, earth, act, principle, audience, hospital, rise, guy, late, congratulations. You, you have a fantastic working memory if you made it this far. All right, this game is actually a test uh, and w to test what's called working memory span. And it was developed by scientists Meredith Deneman and Patricia Carpenter. And as you can see, it, it's a way of measuring how much information you kind of maintain while having like these distractors being thrown at you at the same time. And that's all of what working memory is. So how did you do? And when Carpenter and Daneman originally did this test, they found that the average working memory span for college students was somewhere between three and four items. That means most people can only remember three or four words. Uh, and when they did their initial findings, that's where it landed. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what's going to happen in the future with that. Like, is that the final word on that? Are there larger memory spans? How far can that go? All right. So let's first talk, jump into like, well, what is and isn't working memory? In 92, Alan Baddeley laid down the foundation for a model of memory called working memory. Working memory is not a comprehensive model of memory because it does not include encoding for long-term memory or long-term memory recall. So we're just looking at the short-term, what was traditionally called short-term memory. However, Baddeley's work has largely been accepted for the model of short-term memory and is still used even in neuroscience today. It is the 
type of memory that you use to keep information fresh in your memory. Further, the working memory model has some implications for long-term memory, and it has some importance for teaching as well. And we're going to take a look at the details of that shortly. What are the parts of working memory and how do they work together? So the initial model included like what's called a tripartite. This just means three parts, a three-part system that included an attention controller uh, that's called the central executive, a visual spatial sketch pad, and uh, a phonemic reasoning uh, portion called the phonological loop. So that's like for speech-based information. The three parts operates kind of like a single handle faucet where the controller is the handle of the faucet and then the hot and cold water are represented by the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad. So it, you can, in a single handle, if you shift it more to one side, you're giving more attention and resources to that one side, right? So you could give more attention to your uh, verbal parts or aspects of, of your memory or to your visual spatial parts. And the attention controller is kind of what controls which way that's going. And this makes sense because uh, people have a limited amount of attention. We don't have attention for everything. We got to focus that attention in specific ways. So how do people differ in their working memory? Uh, Alan Baddeley cites the two research that we mentioned earlier, Daneman and Carpenter, to kind of highlight how people uh, can range in their working memory span. And when, he, she, when they originally did the test, they found uh, that the average person can remember between three and four words, and their, their initial test maxed out at six words. Uh, subsequent tests have found that uh, you can actually find people that have a working memory span that can go all the way up to nine items because that's where it's been maxed out so far. And we don't really know how many people can go beyond that, but it's not many. Right, because the further away you get from three to four, the smaller and smaller the amount of people that are capable of doing that. Now, there are some people that uh, might be able to go beyond nine, and they have like exceptional working memories. Um, and the other component to this is the types of things that you're being asked to remember also tends to matter, right? So, if you're doing a working memory span uh, test with visual things, visual items. And the items are everyday household items. So like it could be like a couch, a lamp, a vase, you know, even a computer, something that you see every single day. Then you can actually, the average can be pushed up to five items. So there's a different test that can be for that. But four to five items or five items, if it's familiar item, like things, and three to four if it's things that, you know, maybe abstract words that you're not all that familiar with. All right. So in another area that people um, kind of differ uh, are in what are called intelligence related tasks. So these intelligence related tasks can include things like uh, Raven's matrices, which is uh, kind of like these four, I think it's four boxes, uh, or maybe it's nine boxes. I think it's nine boxes. And the last one is unfilled. And you have to figure out from the context clues what's going to go into that last box. Uh, or even things like the SAT. People with higher working memories tend to do better on tests and on these intelligence te tasks. So they tend to have like higher IQ scores as well. Uh, further studies can have shown that if you have a large working memory, you're actually really good at technical learning capacity. So maybe if you're working with your hands or you're working with 3D objects, or you're working in anything that's technical, then your working memory is going to determine your capacity to learn those technical skills. And as far as whether or not you can improve your working memory, the results are kind of all over the place. Because working memory is actually a really complex system that has a lot of, uh, even within the, the visual spatial sketch pad and the phonological loop, there's all these like subcomponents that have been kind of like discovered. And so it's it's kind of like asking, all right, uh, can you make a car go faster? Well, what part of the car are you going to change, right? That's like, that's what makes it a little bit more complicated. But there may be hope for fixing what's called the attentional controller. Now, the attentional controller is how much attention that you can give to some 
to one object. Now, recently, we've seen that people's attention spans have kind of gotten smaller and smaller and smaller because of the immediate gratification that your cell phone gives you. But there does seem to be a a way of alleviating that through meditation and uh, mindfulness. So I recently heard this uh, Alan Baddeley, you know, getting interviewed on the podcast called Navigating Neuropsychology. So if you're into psychology, that's like a really cool and awesome website or podcast. And he basically says like, yeah, there's like, it's kind of hard and maybe even impossible to change your working memory span, but you can definitely fix your attention controller if you've not been using your, your memory correctly. So it might have become deficient through meditation or through mindfulness. So that might be an option to bring into your classroom if you're noticing that a lot of your students are having trouble like focusing or more importantly, getting rid of uh, inputs that aren't really serving them. So uh, other hope is that there have been certain tasks that have shown to help out uh, people that have ADHD or Alzheimer's and to improve their short-term memory. But those, uh, like, those techniques are really specific to those subgroups because they have very specific things wrong with either their uh, with their attention controller. So why is working memory important to us, to teachers? So working memory is how students actually start to engage with material, especially if it's new material. So inherent working memory capacity can uh, come correlates with like a lot of positive outcomes like doing better on tests and being better at technical training. But it, and because we know that you can't really increase it in any significant way, or you can't really increase it so that it generalizes, right? You might be able to increase your ability on a very specific task, but that won't, doesn't mean that it's going to translate to doing a bunch of other related tasks or even non related tasks. Uh, but what we should note is that uh, there's a difference between processing speed and then capacity. And those, uh, and Baddeley kind of mentions this in in the article. He says, reasoning performance was more dependent on previous knowledge than working memory, which in contrast appeared to be more dependent on sheer speed of processing. So The basic idea is that if you see a kid kind of responding really quickly and understanding things really fast, like what they have is a good working memory capacity, but that doesn't mean that other students that aren't capable of responding quickly are incapable of uh, reasoning, right? Either phonological reasoning or visual spatial reasoning. Uh, It just means that they might, because their memory span is a little bit shorter, they have to chunk the information more times in order to absorb the whole thing. And so this has a a significance in how we treat our students, right? And how we conduct certain things. This is why it's important to leave this space of time between asking a question and then getting an answer. So it allows students that have a smaller working memory span to process the information. And it also helps them if they actually use their phonological loop. So if they talk to a partner, right? And then they can have that back and forth to come up with an answer before being prompted to get an answer. All right. Another implication has to do with uh, individual differences and reading comprehension. So because students with high working memory capacity can really read relatively large text uh, and extract out the meaning out of it, uh, they, they tend to have high reading comprehension scores on tests, like the SAT. Um, uh, however, since uh, there's certain students that have smaller capacities, then they aren't able, they tend to get like kind of distracted by distractors a little bit more. So it becomes harder for them to kind of go through large pieces of text. Now, there's two solutions that you can have to this. Number one, you can uh, break up the text into smaller pieces and then present it piecemeal to your students. Or uh, even better, or the best way, 
or what I think is like, honestly, like the only way you should really be doing this is you can give students a skill on how to chunk large pieces of information. Now, if you remember from uh, my talk on motivation, this is how you motivate students. You don't want to make the curriculum easier for them. What you want to do is you want to give them the skills and to practice the skills of being able to access the information themselves because this is what gives them ownership over all of that information. And so because they have ownership over it, now they're going to be a little bit more motivated. And if they see that, okay, I'm taking this technique that I learned and I'm applying it and I'm being successful, then that means that I am capable of being successful. So any reading comprehension task or skills that you want to do that's going to help your students chunk up information is going to be really helpful, especially for the students that have smaller working memory capacity spans, right? It's not that they aren't capable of understanding. It's that they need a, a method of accessing that information. So there, if you you can Google a lot of techniques. Here's some that I found that were actually pretty good, uh, which was like Avid's Focus Notes. You know, and uh, you can also look up, uh, uh, there's this thing called Active Reading, which was developed by uh, Princeton. And Chunking, which is uh, another strategy that you can find. Uh, and what these do is they basically t help students pay attention to the most important and meaningful parts of the text. And because they're focusing on smaller parts, their working memory spans don't have to be quite so large in order for them to comprehend the material. So that's like the, the basic brain science to teaching skills. And so I'll present, uh, I'll include links to all of these below or in the description. Uh, all these strategies help students break down text into more like manageable pieces. And that's all you really want to do is give them the skills. As a part of analyzing the phonological loop, Baddeley uh, also explains there's this thing called the irrelevant speech effect, and which has profound implications for teaching. So this is like an interesting thing, but... Let's, let's, talk, let's hear from what the author has to say about it. He says that this is, refers to a reduction in recall of lists of visually presented items brought about by the presence of irrelevant spoken material. So the test was actually uh, kind of interesting. So what they did is they, they got a bunch of um, pictures for people to memorize, right, to kind of like figure out what they're... Uh, what they can memorize in a short amount of time. So testing their working memory. But what they would do is they would have them repeat a word, either out loud or in their heads, uh, that was irrelevant. So they would go like, okay, just say the word the over and over and over again as I show you these pictures. So the people will be going the, 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 there's a picture one, the, 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 picture two, the, 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 picture three, the, 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 picture four. And then what would wind up happening is, be, uh, is that their ability to recall all this information once they were done got significantly reduced because they're constantly having to say that irrelevant speech. Now, this has a very specific application to what we do in, in classes. A lot of the times, uh, especially in a science class, uh, because that's what I'm more, most familiar with, what we would do is we would present a picture or an image or a video or something and we would talk over it and kind of like explain the concepts that are on there. That is the wrong thing to do. What we need to do is we need to get rid of as much noise as possible when you're presenting some new visual piece of information. And that's because any kind of speech that doesn't really feel relevant to what's going on in the picture is going to interfere with their ability to absorb or process what's happening in a given picture. So if you show a demonstration or if you show a picture, and but you still want to engage with them in a specific way, give your instructions before you show the picture and after or after you show the picture or the visual representation, but don't say anything while you're showing it to them. Give them that 30 seconds to a full minute 
to kind of just look at what is happening and for them just to process everything that is happening. And when you do that, that allow that eliminates any distractors and helps them stay focused on the information that you're presenting to them. And so as you do that, then once you're done or once you give them that amount of time, then you can start to ask questions or you can start prodding and start trying to figure out what what, what skills are they using, reasoning skills to uh, attack this material. So is this the final word on working memory? Uh, no. Since the original um, uh, laid out of working memory, which was the original one was actually in 1974 when it was proposed, the, and then later Alan Baddeley, like just decided to take all the research in, in 92 and came up with this working memory model, which has persisted with time. Uh, then uh, there's been changes to the model. So in like 2000 or 2001, he decided to add this other thing called like the episodic buffer. And the episodic buffer was just kind of like a way, it's more of like a 3D space where you take in different pieces of information and organize it into this little space. And um, and even then, there's been other uh, like researchers like Nelson Cowan who proposed their own uh, models and of memory and to kind of like challenge Alan Baddeley's. So it's like a pretty cool, uh, 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 like battle, I guess. Baddeley's bat battling right there. So, uh, and I'll go over those in future episodes, but I hope you, that you've enjoyed, uh, my little like spiel on, uh, working memory and yeah, uh, if you've enjoyed the podcast, uh, I really hope that you uh, support us and by sharing the podcast out, uh, like and subscribe it, or maybe if you found anything useful, please share it with friends and family. Uh, you can also join us on our journey. You can find me on Instagram at lessismore.education. Uh, you can find me on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash less is more education. If you prefer to see these ep or reading over listening, then I have what's called a sub stack where I put, where I write out everything and I put it on there for you guys to reference. Uh, and you can find that at less is more education.substack.com. I really appreciate you listening to me and spending some time with me today. Thank you very much. And I'll catch you later. <laughs>